and it's Thomas John, right? Uh, no. Oh. It's a T E J A Y. Welcome to another exciting episode of Griffin Ball Podcast. I am your host, Billy Daniels. When Dave looks extremely tired right now, he's rubbing his eyes. If you're watching the video and just finding him incredibly attractive, as all of our male viewers find him, and we're we're excited about that. So, welcome again to the show, Dave. How the heck are you? I'm not tired. Not tired. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm doing great. By your (laughs) rubbing your eyes, typically that's a sign of being a little bit tired and then moving on to the next person we've got john the j johnson down there how are you john i'm doing fantastic i just like to make up new nicknames every week for you guys not good nicknames you should no that's why i do it they don't have to be good nicknames. they don't have to be good that's right i can do whatever i want Uh i have a microphone and you will listen to everything i say (laughs) they can be better yeah wedding singer yes (laughs) (laughs) and then there's peter the hog hansen down there in his newly uh office i guess is where you're doing in a quiet zone this is your tower it is the quiet zone it is yes it is the quiet zone still your microphone is weird but great we're going to power through uh and we'll miss the first five seconds of everything you say and then (laughs) finally we're moving over to the star of the show uh thomas john sullivan out of (laughs) out of (laughs) of chicago area not really i don't even know where you reside anymore is it oak park is that where it is? Uh, uh, live in Wheaton and work in. Oh, Oak that's Park. right. That's right. I was way off. Wheaton. That's no, right. It's okay. So, yeah. Long time. Thanks friend. so much for having me on, Billy. Oh my gosh. Well, it's not just me. It's all of us. They they asked to do this. I refused because I knew of the shenanigans that were probably going to about to ensue on this uh, episode. I'm incredibly nervous for all the dirt that DJ has on me and can have on me. Uh, and re- has no filter, which is and the rest great. of us are very excited for it. Yes, exactly. So uh, yes. today, yes. So today's episode, uh, what we're doing here is, you know, TJ has longtime listener, first time, second time, actual guest of the podcast here, and uh, he sends me text messages or voicemails of the things that we do and don't say one of which being please stop telling people to buy used golf clubs so we have invited him on (laughs) to give us 27 reasons of why you should be fit by a pga professional (laughs) and dj being a master pga professional uh residing in wheaton as we decided uh supposedly we're really not sure where he resides honestly uh but TJ, go ahead. Talk ab- about yourself. How are you? What are you doing? What's the weather like? Yeah. Uh, well, it's cold up here in the Chicago area. And again, yes. thank you very much, guys, for having me on. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to listen to you guys. I get excited every time one of those uh, one of your podcasts comes through. So, uh, as Billy said, longtime listener, um, definitely longtime screamer into Billy's voicemail. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I've been a uh, PGA member since two thousand seven. Wow. Um, I uh, got my master PGA professional status a few years ago. It was the third or fourth youngest in the country to do so. Uh, and, and the director of instruction at uh, golf tech in Oakbrook and, wow. um, you know, just and, trying to help people play better golf and elected to recently in 2021, you reside on a board PGA. Yes, uh, yes. I'm uh, one of the new members of the uh, Illinois PGA Board of Directors, uh, basically in charge of the teaching and coaching committee. So I have a lot of help there. Uh, so I want to go back to the excitement level that you arise to when you hear that. Uh, I think they're called ping notifications when in, you know when you see an episode come out. Would you classify that as 1.78 times excitement when the episode comes out from your normal level of excitement? 
No, it's um, you know, more like melancholy. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, I I am. I'm excited to hear what you guys have to bring, and I think the um, the just the general uh, kind of listening to how you guys are talking about your game, and you mm. know the, the knowledge that you do have, uh, and and Billy, the knowledge that you think you have. Uh, it's, Thank you. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. You know, yeah. I think it's uh, I think it's awesome. So I, I do, I have my opinions. Um, and you know, I think, you know, golf and golf instruction is something that you can have your opinions on it. Uh, mm-hmm. I like to try to stick to things that are a little bit more measurable, uh, cause it's really hard to improve at something if you can't measure it. So you wouldn't like uh, goals. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited to listen to that one. That one's actually not public MP- yet. I want to remind you, but before we get, uh, done with the episode, I really want you to remember and tell our listeners the website of which you got your forged master PGA professional uh, documents from. Me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what was that website again? Okay. Uh, eat a dick.com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I worked hard for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is going splendidly. <laughs> Oh, so you really did. You really did get your master PGA professional stuff. That wasn't yes. a joke when you told me that. Okay, got it. Didn't, didn't you recently make a, a golf publications list of uh, teaching professionals as well? Did, do I recall that correctly? Uh, yes. So for, um, I think it was the 20... 20- 18 to 2020 seasons uh golf digest runs um on on alternating years the best in state and they also do best young teachers so for the last two times i was elected or selected to be uh recognized as best uh one of the best teachers in the state of illinois and also one of the best young teachers in the country oh that's awesome awesome gosh yeah Yeah, cool they usually keep those lists to to instructors who are under the age of 40. So fingers crossed for next year. Oh, how long until you're over the age? I hate to tell you this, TJ. Wait, what? Say that again, Pete. It's all downhill after 40. Oh. I'm still in my 30s. We know. Yeah. Yeah. You say that often. I know. Yes. I'm you going to that. continue to say it for the next six months. I will live huh? this dream of being in my 30s. TJ, how long until you're not in your 30s? Uh, I still got three years. Okay. I don't, to be young again. <laughs> <laughs> well, so basically what you're telling us is you, you know a lot more about golf than, than we think that we do. And, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, I, I, I'd like to think that I have a little, I can shine some light on some misconceptions that you guys may or may not have. Yeah. Fair that enough. A, I, accept I was going to say that was a subjective statement because how, what do we classify as knowledge of golf? I'd say probably a master PGA professional might have a little bit more. Really? Maybe. Just a smidge. I think I can tell you something your, that I learned. Bumper. You, you can be the bumpers that keep us from going to the gutter. I think that we do an episode where I teach at Golf Tech for TJ <laughs> for a day. And then we measure the improvements of, of his. Sounds like a brilliant I idea. Maybe you might what be if, what if, refunds. <laughs> what, if you, what if you just uh, take a lesson? Like you did back in like 07 or whenever that was. We can we can pull up the swing that you have from 07. Ooh, I wonder if I can screen share and bring that up for everybody. Ooh, can you find that? Do you yes. really? Oh, yeah. oh my yeah. gosh. Okay. Wow. That was was that an 07? Mm-hmm. No, it wasn't. Yeah, because you left together. the Glen Club. I left the Glen Club in 07 in the fall of 07. That's when I started golf deck. Oh my gosh. I didn't even realize that that was 07. I thought that wow. Okay. Holy moly. I remember that now. It was a pure gold golf swing back then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was good for you. Thank you. <laughs> Solid answer. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the only way to measure yourself is to benchmark against yourself. So it's a good starting point. That was. Is that why you don't set goals? Because you, know, you never, uh, never fail getting them. I don't know how to set goals. First off, I don't know how to spell smart. So I don't know how to be specific, measurable, <laughs> attainable. I don't even know what the R and the T stand for. So there we go. Realistic and timely. There we go. Thank you. Just like old times, just like a married couple who finishes each other's sentences. That's sentences. <laughs> it was so close. <laughs> so 
Well, let's get into it. Let's quit horsing around because we could do We're going to do this afterwards. Uh, but Dave, do you want to take lead or do you want me to take lead on on getting TJ to give us the first reason? What is the first reason, TJ, that someone should get fit? Uh, I think the first and probably the biggest reason is, in all seriousness is just to find out if the current clubs are making the game hard. Um, I mean, the, the, the game is as hard as it is uh, for everyone. Uh, and what we found through uh, the hundreds of thousands of fits that we've done um, is that, you know, just finding out and testing the new equipment, um, it just might be, make the game a little bit more fun for somebody. So whether it's, you know, you know, a, a different head, which probably has the biggest factor uh, included, uh, you know, might give them the extra yards or more forgiveness, or we really wouldn't know until we actually actually have someone test it. Um, and then the game's a little bit more fun and a little bit, you know, a little bit easier for them. Uh, I'd say that's probably the, the biggest reason and why you just want to just double check because if you're using something from as even as early as four or five years ago, you know, the technology that's in place right now just you know, with distance and everyone knows distance is king. So, you know, you have someone who's hitting their seven iron, 105, 110 yards, they gain it to 130. Awesome. They put a new club in their hand and now it's 150. Uh, now they're actually, you know, playing the game and having a little bit more fun and hitting more greens and regulation, lowering their scores and mm -hmm. not embarrassing themselves. Oh, how many, uh, how many people would you say come in, in and you find, that they are using clubs that are putting them at a disadvantage. Is it, is it a high percentage? Um, yes. Uh, I would say, I would say almost everybody, but there are plenty of times that we do a, that I'll do a club fitting. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, a guy had a 2007 burner. So the black one before they switched to the white, um, and he had that thing all the way from, uh, you know, I'm sorry, it was 09. It was the 09 burner. Um, and we did a fitting every year for four or five years when I was working with him. Wow. And every everything that we tested against that driver just didn't perform well until he tried the new, I think it was like the TS2. And he hit it 40 yards farther in the air. It was just kind of like, holy cow. Okay. Like we wow. finally found something that was better. Uh, now obviously he was working on the, his game in that time frame, but, uh, in that same time, we tested everything almost every year and just nothing performed that well. So he just never made a buying decision and that's fine with me, you know? So I would say that he is by far the outlier. Um, the vast majority of people will find some advantage, whether it is, you know, it feels better, sounds better, looks better, goes farther, go, launches higher, spins more or less, or is a little bit more accurate or whatever. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of our job to try to find that thing for that person. Uh, and if we can't, we can't, that, that's okay. Uh, not, my job is not necessarily to try to sell someone clubs. It's just to find out if the current clubs are making the game too hard. Interesting. Yeah, and that's an interesting point that you bring up there. Cause I was going to ask, like when, when you say go get fit, you're talking go to a, a certified club fitter, uh, PGA professional along those lines, not necessarily going to a box store where they may or may not be getting paid commissions for whatever they may be selling each month. And not to bag on those people because they got to make a living too. Um, but in the best interest of a golfer, um, it, it would probably be best to go see somebody like you or, or similar in that regard. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, is a short answer. Uh, long answer is so at one of the golf techs that I worked at, which is no longer there because we were actually located inside of Golfsmith, which, uh, is no longer a company anymore. Cause they went bankrupt. Right. Um, but, um, they would have either monthly contests or, uh, vendors would have contests. So, maybe a, a major manufacturer would have a, a contest in June and says, Hey, you know, we'll give the top sales performer an extra $50 gift card. Mm. Uh, and I can guarantee you that those sales guys were handing people that manufacturer a whole bunch. Uh, July rolls around and Taylor made is, oops, oh, sorry, not cut that. I don't know. Another <laughs> manufacturer uh, would run a very similar uh, yeah, contest. It's, it's spelled differently uh, with an I. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, strike that from record. Um, 
Uh, but they would be running a, a very similar contest the following month. So literally depending on the day of the weekend that you went in, you would be presented a different opportunity of a club based on their own incentives. And trust me when I say this, like that affects their pocket, as you said, right? They got to make a living. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to affect the type of club. Whereas for, for me or most PGA professionals, um, they're going to give you what they think is best. Uh, and if someone's on staff with a major manufacturer, they should still open the door of, of the opportunity to, for other manufacturers as well. And, and I would say the vast majority of us do exactly that. I think, you know, I think a couple things come to mind when you say that, of, of course, there's incentives for people who are selling things. That's, that's sales in general, you know, you're being exactly. compensated for that. I, and I'm not trying to put the onus on the, the person purchasing the club, but that's, that's typically in the consumer's hands to make a decision. They're just being conveyed the information that this is a good club for you, whether they choose to purchase it or not is up to them. You know, they, they can see the numbers. They should probably do their due diligence, just like a doctor, you might want to get a second opinion. And I, and I furthermore would say, I think this day and age, the consumer is starting to be smart enough to realize that, that, that resides in a lot of things. I'm not like off, I'm not saying, I'm not arguing to your point, but like you go to Nebraska furniture, Mart, you go to anywhere, they're being compensated for selling TVs or, or furniture and whatnot. So I think I get where you're going with that, but I think we're, we're, the consumer is, is smarter than they were 15, 20, 30 years ago to maybe do their due diligence a little bit and make sure that the club is right for them. You know, I think maybe yes and no, and, and yeah. I don't want to cut anybody off, but you know, if I'm completely brand new to golf and I walk into That's a, good point. a box store, I don't know what I don't know. And if the sales staff is handing me a club and saying, this mm -hmm. is the one, I'm likely to be like, okay, cool, let's go. I guess, uh, let me I, I totally agree. And maybe, may, maybe yeah. let me rephrase that. I think given this day and age, the amount of content and information and data that is out there, I would anticipate that consumers can do some sort of research prior or post getting fit to see, is this a good fit for me? And I think the, I, I think there are, so I think you might be speaking to people in your passion for the game of golf. Um, whereas a lot of people that come in who are just learning the game or who are just getting into the game, True. they almost don't know what they don't know. So they don't know what yeah. questions to ask. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of times or basically every fitting that I do, I'll ask them like, Hey, have you done any research? Do you know what you're looking for? Do you know, you know, are you interested in a Mizuno? Do you have any, you know, I see that you have some tailor-made irons right now. Are you biased to tailor-made? Right. And by far, by far people are you know, saying, no, I really haven't done any research. I've just kind of, kind of in your hands. Um, you're the, you know, and that's where I think getting fit by any PGA professional, um, there's a little bit more, um, what's the right word? Um, responsibility for the member to do what's right by the person. Um, whereas the PGA member, you mean the PGA? Yes. Member? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The PGA member. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, we would do right by them a little bit more so than someone who is getting a commission or, or, you know, something along those lines. And, and again, to, to Dave's point, I think you mentioned that, you know, not to, not to bash them. A lot of my friends have, or did, or still do that. Right. And that's okay. Um, you know, I would just prefer the vast majority of people to actually get fit. What you do with that information is up to you. Uh, and you want to, you know, take that and go to eBay. Okay. Good luck with getting exactly what you hit, but Go True. Ahead. Yeah. That's a, it's a, a Dave in your corner that he'll he'll scour the internet's everywhere and find what what you need. <laughs> yeah. He can he can get clubs <laughs> off the dark web like there's no tomorrow. I don't know what TJ just did, but he made note of something and <laughs> and did something right after you said it. That. It was it was just a, it was a mental note. That's all. Note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, it, in all seriousness, I mean, like if if. So like, let's say, Dave, you come into a golf tech or you come up to Chicago and get fit by me. Uh, and let's say we fit you for some irons and you hit your seven iron. Just give me an example. We'll kind of pick on you before I pick on Billy. How far do you hit your seven iron? 95 yards. It's my 160 club. <laughs> 95 yards. Okay. So, so 
I understand what club you said it was, but how far do you hit it? 160 yards every single time, right on the money. Right. Okay. Got it. And that's carry <laughs> and, and roll out. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That, and that's, yes. If, that's, if I'm, if I have a 160 yeah. yard par three, I'm taking dead aim at the flag with my seven iron, no wind. Perfect. And it's landing right in the cup every time. Understood. So it's my, <laughs> it's my carry. That's 160 carry. You need to okay. be for the Got it. clubs. And if it's, if it's a par five, is it the same or is it just on par threes? Sorry. I'm no, just, just, uh, just on par threes. Okay. Only. When, only when you can tee it up, right? Yes. Uh, like so an inch so and a half off the ground. That so let's that, just can say I that you get hit. my putter, TJ. Would that help me? <laughs> putting stroke? Okay. Sure. Just yeah. put it right. on your ball marker. Yes. yes. On the tee box, you can. Yes. <laughs> um, so let's say, for example, you get, you're getting fit and I don't know, the dispersion is 13 yards wide and, you know, you put a Mizuno club in your hand and you hit it, you know, 165 carry and it's, you know, seven yards wide, then, you know, then it would be up to you to make that decision, you know, is, is the 125 per club, uh, on a seven piece set, is that worth it? And, you know, then you have to make the decision. And if you want to take that information with your, you know, uh, whatever Mizuno pro two twenty threes or the newest ones are out there, uh, with the project X five, five and half long and one degree up. Um, you know, you want to try to find that on the internet. Go ahead. Cool. You might, I mean, you got paid for your service, right? It's all good. (laughs) (laughs) I I build my own. As long as you have the right. Yeah. Yeah. I build my right. own clubs, so I, yeah, it, I'm I'm good to go. It, it's easy for me to 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 do that, but I, I certainly see that not everybody's in that same boat. But yeah, to your point, I I think um, the the dispersion thing is is definitely something that I probably don't know. I I miss everything both directions, so who knows if a different if a different club would help me with that? But you, you know, know what you should do, Dave? You should buy more clubs. I should. Oh, no. yeah. absolutely. Uh-huh. I don't need more, more clubs. Round take. The buy problem one is I've got all my money in something with putters. Wait, what? Buy one seven iron of every set and then just test it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Actually, what I want to do is That'll get a set. I, I just want to get one club from each manufacturer, four all the way down to pitching wedge. There you go. <laughs> go that. It's that way. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent behind that. What yeah, that with a different right? shaft in each one. Oh god. Yeah, right. But with you different could... grips too. And sizes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But in theory, theoretically, you could have a different manufacturer, a different club, a different shaft that works for that is different for every club, theoretically, right? And I, I do have that other than my irons. I mean, obviously, my irons are, are one shaft and my wedges are a different shaft just because of feel and what I'm accustomed to. Mm-hmm. My driver shaft is different than my three wood shaft, which is different than what I currently have in my five wood that I haven't tried, which is different than what's in my hybrid which is different than what's in my driving iron so um could i use a professional fitting probably but through trial and error i just found stuff that i like and works for me um but that doesn't mean i could not benefit from seeing somebody like a tj Mm. yeah and i think you're you're the outlier uh in that sense and billy i think a different way to say the same thing that you said is that it's very rare that one manufacturer will fit someone through the entire bag you yeah. know, between you know, wedges right. through driver. It's yeah. very rare that that would actually work um, even for the best players in the world. Right. That's it. Yeah. Is it, I don't know why I've never, I feel kind of dumb saying this, but I've never thought in the fact of maybe you should play a different manufacturer for different areas of your club or different areas within your bag. And, and I'm not, I'm not saying I don't have all of them. You should them. get fit to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so is that reason number two? <laughs> Just in where go for launch. Uh, <laughs> for fitting. So. I mean, if you don't, if you don't know, you should do something and find out. Right. Yeah. Well, you don't know until you know, and now, you know, you know, right. you don't know. like for me, and like you said, I'm kind of the outlier. I'm, I'm the guy that scours the internet and just, you know, what's the flavor of the month? Let me try something new. And we, we've got a friend out at the golf course. First thing he does when he sees me out there is he looks in my bag to see if there's something new. Um, but, you know, for me, it's just trying to find something that I like to look at. I like the feel of and gives me a ball flight that I'm okay with. 
mm. um, with some moderate consistency. So sure. I'm, I'm fitting myself based on all of those criteria, but I have found going to like a tailor-made demo day. And of course they're trying to sell their product, but you know, they're fitting me in a shaft in my head. I'm like, there's, there's no way that I would have ever put myself into the shaft because it just seemed like something that wouldn't fit what I thought my swing was. And so it was very enlightening in that regard. And it's kind of, it took me in a whole different direction of buying stuff online so. <laughs> new and building new stuff. Uh, so TJ, when you're, when you're working with somebody and they, you know, brought in their, their clubs and is, is there like a running theme where you're like, wow, you shouldn't be playing an extra stiff shaft or you should probably not have a 64 degree wedge or, is there something that you that. see frequently that, you know, maybe you always need a 64, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> An 80. Um, I would say the vast majority of people either they weren't fit or they were fit at like a demo day uh, or they just ordered their clubs through their club and they don't even really know what they have in their bag. So um, I would say that, you know, more often than not, you know, they just don't know um, or they're just, the clubs are old. So, you know, probably the, the most common thing that I see are, are wedges with grooves that are not sharp. Yeah. Um, you know, that's kind of like the number one thing that people don't realize that they should be changing their wedges as often as they probably should, depending on how many rounds they play. Um, I know the answer to that but question, just, but the, um, I'm just gonna ignore you, Billy. The, uh, the, the general theme is that, you know, if you're playing something that is from whatever, I almost said 07, but like from, you know, 2017, that's five years ago. There's a lot of technology that has gone into clubs every single year that you're probably losing. Um, and again, as I said earlier, it's just, it's just a matter of testing it and finding out. And, you know, if nothing current, then you wait six months to a year and you do it again. Yeah. So you're saying John's MP, what do you have? 68, 67, sir. They're, they're due for an upgrade. I would say that I'm probably a perfect contender to try out a different set of irons. I was, uh, they work so, great. They work great when you play 110 rounds a year, but when you play 30, they work against you. What are they? The MP17s? Uh, the 67s. The 67s. Okay. Yeah. So like the new, I think the. So you would want, probably want to stay within that Mizuno area as far as like the look and top line and feel. Um, but like the 223s, I think they are, are somewhat similar to the 67s. Uh, 221s, I think, are the 67s. John's getting I play old clubs. stuff. Is so it the original grip? Soul. No, it's the original not, grip, we have a problem. Not the original <laughs> grip, but damn close to it. It might be. Sand, he just takes he, sand, sand, sand. Sand. Yeah, he sands yeah. his grips down. So I don't wear a glove. So, yeah. Traction is uh, critical. Six O's or uh, what? What shaft you have in there? Uh, it's three hundreds. Okay. Mm. So TJ, I got uh, a question. Yeah, please. Um, like what? So you you mentioned wedges are the ones that are you find that are the, probably the club that needs to be replaced the most. Obviously, you're hitting them most frequently. Um, this year, that's kind of one of the things that I'd like to replace in my bag because it's been a couple years. If I walk into a golf tech and say, I need a wedge fitting, what, like, what is my experience? What should it look like? Um, well, hopefully it would be, it would start with a little bit of a tour just to kind of get you familiar with the technology that we use. Mm -hmm. um, ask you a few questions about your game, get a full understanding of, you know, what specifically about the wedges that you want to try to maybe fix or change. Um, I would probably advise you to also bring your, your next lowest lofted club beyond the wedges. So whether it's a pitching wedge or nine iron, just to make sure gapping is appropriate, check the lie lofts, make sure that the shafts are what we think they are. Double check the lengths, give you a recommendation off of your wrist to floor and height, just to kind of get a general ballpark. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just have you hit like a, a 40 to 60 yard shot with your highest lofted club. Uh, take a look at the metrics of launch and spin. And if it's not launching around 30 and spinning around, you know, 8,000, 
uh, then you're probably losing a whole bunch, especially when it comes down to using a high lofted club out of rough. I don't know. Do you guys have rough in Kansas city? Just so, <laughs> so, and, yeah. it's, and it sometimes rains. So, you know, anything yeah. that you have to kind of gain traction there, uh, you know, you're, you're losing a whole bunch and then it's just a matter of testing a two or three different wedge heads that you think you might like, whether it's the newest, latest and greatest, you know, shiny thing, or if it's this like dull face thing that you actually are a little bit more familiar with, um, you know, uh, can I use, I can use uh manufacturer names, right? You guys use yeah. that, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So whether it's the, you know, the jaw, the new jaws from Callaway or the new SM nines that are coming out or the, yes. you know, the Cleveland's, um, the full face, whatever. Um, and then it's up to you and the person that's fitting you to kind of talk a little bit more about like, um, bounces and relationships of like where you play and why you should do that. Um, you know, uh, I think the vast majority of people don't think about it at all. And the people who do think about it probably overthink it. Uh, so then it's just kind of finding that, you know, working with the person that is fitting you to say, Hey, you know what, I actually really like this in this situation. Uh, and then you just build out the set matrix from that, but that like 30 launch and around eight to 9,000 is kind of ideal for that 40 to 45 yard shot carry. So let me ask you, um, how quickly are you able to determine whether it's the club that's the issue with the, the ideal numbers, or if it's the swing, as an example, using myself, I've got fairly new wedges and I couldn't get a wedge to stick to a green to save my life. I was able to determine after multiple rounds, it's not the clubs, it's me and I need to fix my swing. But how quickly are you, a professional club fitter, a master professional, able to diagnose that as, as opposed to the 40 rounds of me banging my head against the wall? Yeah, so hopefully someone's taking lessons. Uh, and they're getting fit through their professional. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in my opinion, I think there should be some sort of balance. Um, you know, you should be working on your ball striking for whatever category there is, and then you should do a fitting, you know, for a new student, I like to just test, uh, within the first five lessons, probably at around the fifth or sixth lesson. Uh, cause then it, you know, that those five lessons kind of give me an opportunity to help that person with their ball striking, mm -hmm. just kind of make ball first contact, have some sort of face control. Um, and then we can actually do a fit, just jump into it right then and there, uh, knowing full well within the first five minutes, I know exactly where I want to get them. So I would actually then tailor a little bit of the fit, uh, towards where I want that person a year from now. Um, so, I don't think I answered your question directly, but I think the, the direct answer is that it has to be some sort of combination sure. uh, between maybe not necessarily changing the swing, but definitely working on a technique or a form that's proficient, uh, especially when you're talking about around the greens. Sure. So what, what kind of customer is like, so let me back that up before I say something really dumb. All right. So there's, there's four of us here and you, right? And I would say that all four of us are pretty different personality wise and golf wise, like John, he's, everything's based on feel. If it doesn't feel right, he's not interested in it, but otherwise he's go with the flow. Billy's kind of similar, but he's got a little bit of times where he's a stickler for things. Um, and, and Pete is just, Pete is 100% go with the flow. I'll do whatever you tell me. And, um, and you know, and I'm just, I'm, I'm a space cadet, right? Who is easiest to work with somebody that comes in like Pete that says, you know, mold me into whatever you want or whatever you think I should be, or somebody that has an idea. They think they know what they're doing. Um, you know, but is still willing to listen, maybe like a, a Billy in that instance, who would you rather work with? And, and as a, as a professional, um, how would you like to be approached in that situation from a new client? Um, that's actually, I, I, I hate the phrase good question because of course it is, because why wouldn't you ask it? Uh, uh, but that's, that's a question that I have really haven't gotten almost ever. Um, I think my ideal student is someone who's passionate. Um, I think it's a, it's a relationship that I'm in really like I'm, any new person uh, it, that I meet for the very first time, like I'm in it, as long as I'm not more passionate about them improving than, than they are, mm -hmm. um, it really doesn't matter. 
Uh, and I've, you know, I, I, I'm sad to say it, but I've had to fire some students where, you know, if I can tell that they're just not in it, uh, you know, then, like, hey, listen, you know, if I'm putting more into this than you are, then something's not right. So let's just separate, mm-hmm. you know, go our separate ways and, and no big deal. Um, so it, it I don't want to say personality it's... doesn't matter, but I, I think it's, you know, I, I feel like I can adapt to, you know, any of you guys uh, and, you know, just kind of tailor the teaching method and the teaching, you know, I still have my own philosophy, uh, but kind of tailor how I go about it to make sure that it fits and, you know, teach people from people who've never touched the club before to guys who are trying to make it on the PGA tour champions uh, and people who are more very feel uh, very mechanical people who want to hit a draw and want to hit a fade. It really doesn't matter as long as they're, they're bringing it uh, every day. Bringing it. So what happened is this is this the animosity i feel no i don't think so <laughs> no i don't yeah i i mean i don't really recall 2007 very well uh so i'm not there was a sure. lot of alcohol back then sure yes. you're older at your old age yes it was a long time ago tj and i were very young uh and we made some questionable decisions you know some bad questions youth. yeah young young stupid and in love yeah <laughs> So I'm going to, I'm going to show you something I, I here, first, TJ. Before we move Go on ahead. to that, I, yeah. I want to say that TJ did do the classic instead of it's not you, it's me. He really did just tell us that it, it's you, not me. I mean, you he's Billy. fired people. Yeah. yeah. It's it's you. No, it's you. You can't take lessons from me anymore. <laughs> I'm sure he can tell who's going in between lessons and beating three or four buckets of balls and right. Oh yeah. Gotta be sure. obvious. Yeah stoic <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or he's frozen i'm frozen. not sure yeah yeah we lost him no nope. yeah tj it's the most stoic i've ever seen somebody uh-huh. yeah um, that's incredibly it's gonna be a, a challenging situation i have no oh. problem with someone asking me like hey why do i need to make this change but um at the same time uh if if they're gonna be reluctant to change uh you know and, and they're maybe a little bit open about it you know then i'll I'll struggle with it for a little while and then eventually I'll just call them out on it and see where we go from there. Hey, TJ, you're going to have to say that again. Cause you were frozen for the first like 25, 20 seconds. Yeah. Oh no. I have yeah. no idea what I said. I was yeah. just flowing. Yeah. Well, well you it's flow. Good. You're, you're a flower. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a flower. You're a flowy. Well, I, Wait, what is yeah. it? Can, flow- I, can, can I get into my, uh, my second reason why someone should get fit or are we just going to still hover on? I don't know. Phone? I was wondering the same thing. I was, we've only gotten to the first one. Yeah. Well, Dave wanted to show something first. So. Well, I just want to ask, like, if I was to walk into a lesson and I'm going to show something on the screen, so the listeners, I'll have to explain it. But if if I walked in with this, oh, uh, Doctor Knockdown, uh huh, eighty degree, eighty degree wedge, cool. What what would you say to me, like right off the bat? Ah, uh, that's a cool toy. <laughs> a cool toy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool toy. I, it I, is, in fact, a cool toy. Yeah. Uh, Dave, do you have a, a fireplace at home? Uh, yes. Do you have a mantle on top of that fireplace? Because you should just like hang that thing like right above the fireplace. Just, like, <laughs> <it's right laughs> there. like what if I'm uh, like supremely short-sighted and I just need to get it straight up and down into my teeth? Ah, <laughs> not now, now we're talking my language. Uh, if we start getting into course strategy, that might be a whole different, uh, episode, but what I'll we're say going- is, is that you should probably chip it onto the green anywhere and two putt and walk away. TJ, That's Dave and I, had I can a, two putt. TJ, Dave and I had an interesting conversation of where we get to go play and you you are going to watch us play and you're going to commentate and talk about our course strategy. Or can I just caddy for you? Sure. Or, are you coming to Kansas city or are we going to Chicago? I'd, I'd, I'd love to travel. Do you? Okay, good. To Kansas city. Does it, I mean, you didn't finish to traveling to a place. You just came yeah. on to travel. No, no. I said, I said, I, I would love to travel. Oh, okay. So you can come here. Okay. You can stay in the <laughs> world headquarters of grouping golf. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, it, it is, it, you guys have an international podcast. It's fantastic. It does. It, it's, it, it's it awesome. does reach world yeah. Australia. It gets down there. Yeah. Yeah. I need to update. Sure. I need to update the resume with that. (laughs) internationally known Uh yeah i wish i could dang okay let's Uh get it why don't we get into uh, me too it's impressive 
Uh, uh, it, it, the second reason why you should get fit. Let's let's go. Yeah. Let's hear it, TJ. Mm-hmm. So I think I think a lot of these actually will. Um, they might be a little bit overlapping from what we've previously talked about, but okay. Um, I think the second reason that I actually put on here is, uh, as I said, I mentioned it earlier, but like just it, just to increase distance. Uh, I think a lot of people think that they need to fix their golf swing first before they get fit, and then they kind of like earn the right to get fit. Um, my question is always like, let me know when you get to that point, and then we'll make a decision, or we can just get fit now. Uh, start gaining at least 10 to 15 yards or whatever it is with new clubs uh, and then continue working on your swing to hit those new clubs even farther. Um, so I think that that could have a lot to do with like the head style, the shaft weight, uh, head weight. There's a whole bunch of combinations that you're, that you're looking at as far as fit, but just overall, just for someone who wants to increase distance, you know, it probably is a little bit of the technique, but it wouldn't hurt just to take a look at the equipment as well. Isn't that true, Billy? Yes, it's 100% true. And we've talked about it on the podcast before. I had the wrong shaft in my driver, and uh, Dave politely pointed out that at my club head speed, I should be hitting it much further than I was. And so we started experimenting, and sure enough, Dave was right. Gained a lot of distance. Uh, put a. I probably still need to be fit. I was not to be I agree. clear. Yeah. I was not fit for the shaft that is my driver, but it definitely uh, has increased my, uh, um, reduced my spin and increased distance for me a lot. Yeah. So. It's kind of like I'm a listener. Um, <laughs> so the, the third reason why someone should get fit, um, I kind of feel like I'm at Letterman a little bit. Number three. Number three. Um, <laughs> the, the club's, could cause so incorrect clubs could actually cause uh poor swing habits so we've been Mm -hmm. talking all along about like which one is it is it one or the other um i have seen mostly with juniors or ladies uh with clubs that are too heavy uh because they are their husbands they were dads they were uh who's ever uh or even you know men for that matter um but the, the i think the shaft weight could have something to do with it the shaft flex could have something to do with it that could cause someone to um modify their swing just to try to make contact with the golf ball um i think a large portion of manufacturers purposely make their clubs a little bit too upright which then uh causes even further uh bad swing habits but I'll, I won't uh, dive into that too much, but, you know, having something that is just ro- poorly fit or just incorrect, uh, let alone the, the wrong length. Um, I think, you know, Billy, I thought I remember you saying that you played with your grandfather's clubs when you first started playing, you know, yep. uh, I think a lot of people tend at least, you know, who, who are, I'm going to put air quotes around our age, uh, kind of started with something like that because it was like, Oh, Hey, here's, here's dad's clubs. I'm just going to say Um, that Dave and John and Pete are not the same age as us. It's fine. I don't need to, I don't, I don't need to go to bat for you, Billy. I'm I'm here for other reasons. (laughs) (laughs) Nope. Nope. You're here. You're standing. Yep. Bring him in. I can, I, can, I can tell you tj that's like a, that's exactly what happened to me like i've got my yeah. junior seven iron around here somewhere that i started with when i was seven years old mm-hmm. and it's heavier it's heavier than the seven iron i play now oh, i don't yeah. know what it's right. made out of lead but yeah it was way too heavy for me to be swinging at seven years old <laughs> and i yeah. think it shows and, in your putting stroke too john because you, uh, you use a putter that's always been so long that you you, know, you only rested on the heel like i think i still weigh over swing but not as much because I'm not as limber, but I know I overswing a lot because I grew up with those heavy clothes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I it, think could be, it could be anything. And, you know, you just don't know. Yeah. Well, I think you can directly attribute my flatter swing to the heavier clubs I swung as a junior. I always thought you were yeah. impersonating Rick Valor. I'd buy no. that. <laughs> no, it just, that's my swing. It's always been that way. I could, the club is not above my shoulder. I just, it feels impossible to do that. Or my arm, I guess I should say, is not above the plane of my arm. It's not above my shoulder. <laughs> Look at on that. Face. If you make TJ make a face, you should <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to start getting an eye twitch before too long. 
this is the last episode I do, guys. I gotta go. It is you. It's not me. Yeah. I have a lot of uh, D-I-C-K questions that I could ask Billy right now, but that's okay. Let's do it. Get into it. <laughs> what, what kind of was it a like was it an Airbus or what kind of plane was it that you were talking about? <laughs> You know, he, he was doing all this while he was golfing. Yeah. Right. Oh. In his in his golf cart. Playing golf. <laughs> yeah. Now now, now I'm gonna get a twitch. <laughs> golf. Yeah. It's golf. Yeah. <laughs> uh reason number four. Why get fed. <laughs> yeah, is it, yeah. And on to the next. All right. Um yeah, again, we kind of we kind of talked about it a little bit when we we're kind of diving into the to the wedges, but just overall wedge gapping. Uh, I think for someone who, you know, just went to a place who got their driver fit, that maybe they got matching fairy woods and or a hybrid, they just got their irons fit. Um, there's no reason why a PGA professional or someone can't do just a specific wedge gapping session where you take your four wedges. And you have your, you know, your, your four types of shots that you're trying to hit. So whether it's a one quarter, half, three quarter full, uh, and do like a wedge matrix just to make sure that, you know, the distances and the, like one wedge is not going a lot farther than the other. Uh, that's also a really good exercise to do just for you guys hit three or five shots with each wedge in each category that you feel like you need to kind of dial in, uh, preferably on a launch monitor so you can actually measure it. Uh, and then you might find some that are overlapping. You might find that your three quarter 56 goes just as far as your 60 full, uh, in which case then why try to slam your 60 degree, 105 yards when you have, a you know, three other clubs that go about the same distance. So why are you always picking on me? Why, why just because target, I can, Billy. you're an easy target. Yeah. Long time listener, first time caller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause Billy was just talking about how he wants to maybe change up his setup to go yeah. more to a three wedge approach right three wedge no two wedge. Yeah. like a two wedge, wedge. oh yeah, four, wedge is still a wedge yeah, i yeah. carry yeah i carry four wedges currently and i'm flirting with the idea of getting rid of the 60 for the exact reason of being able to i don't have an issue flighting wedges down and and getting a very low trajectory with them and i do like hitting my 60 for or from 80 yards and hitting it really low with a lot of spin but i can do that with the 56 i did it for i didn't play a 60 until the last couple of years and so i think it's great but i think there are gaps in my game one of which being when i'm in on a very long par five i can drive the ball far enough but then i can't necessarily get to the green in two and i would like to open i would like to be able to get closer to the green in two or beyond the green so driving iron right. or another hybrid in I'm thinking five wood is honestly what I'm thinking. No, Billy. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is gonna this is gonna sound like I'm being facetious, but in, yeah. in my honest opinion, mm -hmm. I think we're the trend, at least on the PGA tour, and something for you to consider. Mm -hmm. Um, again, this is gonna sound like a joke, and I'm actually being serious. Uh, yeah, yeah. I love how I have to qualify that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll so, finish your sentence. Five wood. Thank you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> you go forty six inch driver with like. Yeah what's the loft on your driver nine somewhere on there it's ten five yeah okay so you go 46 with like an eight and a half or nine degree driver that's your like that's your bomber driver okay then you go a 44 inch driver with like 11 degrees and that's kind of more you're like hey let me just kind of snake it through these trees mm -hmm. then you go like two driving iron mm. okay and then that leaves room for more wedges down the bag if you want to so choose. And I think in all, in all honesty, I think without that rule uh, that the USGA came out with uh, shortening the length of drivers, I think on the PGA tour, there was going to be a trend and there still might be, but I think there was going to start to be a more of a trend of like what Phil was doing, what Bryson wanted to do, have your 47 inch driver, have your gamer, which is a little bit shorter, mm -hmm. you know, maybe their gamer only goes 305, 310 you know, and then their bomber goes 370. Um, and then, you know, then you really don't need a fairway wood, which you're, you might've hit more fairways with a three wood, uh, down in Arizona, but your, yeah. your fairway wood is not going to be substantially more accurate than your driver. It's just going to be shorter. So mm -hmm. off the tee, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to play it. 
uh, and on the off times that you do need to hit a green in two on a par five, um, the strategy is probably more advisable to hit a flat face cl club instead of a curved face club, like a five wood or a hybrid. Mm -hmm. So you might as well just hit a, hit a two iron. You generate enough speed to, to carry it and hit it high enough. So just go that way, go with that. I still route. have, have a little more room. I still have it. I just haven't put it in the bag. My two iron. But yeah. Yeah. So you're saying carry, you're not saying carry two, two drivers. drivers. Yeah. Are you yeah, saying I am. Carry yeah, yeah. Carry two drivers, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think I think that's going to be the trend on the PGA Tour. It was definitely going to be on the trend if they didn't change the rule. But even with them changing the rule, I think there's still a possibility that you'll actually start to see that sometimes. And it's mostly going to be Phil and Bryson who start it, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's going to be some of the other longer hitters who also do it. So yours, so because I've contemplated the mini driver of getting the tailor made mini driver, which is like a it's mm -hmm. like 13 degree. Mm -hmm. So have. I guess my current driver or change to a nine, five or an eight, five or something and, and figure out how to hit, <laughs> hit that. Um, no, it, we, we need to build Billy a bomber. That's what we need to do. Yeah. He you needs need... to build a swing where he can hit up on it a yeah. little bit for ideal yeah. launch. I think I know what the 2022 project is. The the phone book on the left foot. Yeah. <laughs> is that what they teach you in golf deck? That's uh, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. TJ oh. and I were talking beforehand. That's <laughs> literally the the key. Interesting, yeah, and it's legal. It's like there's no USG. Oh, you just carry it there. around in your bag and set it down. <laughs> yeah, you put your uh -huh. foot on the T marker in lieu of the the phone uh, book. That makes more sense. Yeah. Then you don't. Then you yeah. just go walk and not have to. Well, we should phone we back, should note book. for all our millennials and whatever ones a phone book. <laughs> Is, so a what large, a is a large document to where everybody's phone number was listed there. Your businesses <laughs> too. Those pages were yellow. So, so what I heard, what I heard is Billy, you need to carry two drivers, yeah. and I need to sell you Doctor Knockdown, the eight yeah, four wedge. wedge. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. that's what I heard. I can't but believe wait, but I, okay. Me. So, so you're saying two drivers. And then no three wood is what right. I heard. And then two iron or driving utility iron or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, then leave, and then leave the wedge in there. Leave the system. I'm going oh. on some buy, sell, trade forums right now. <laughs> that Bill, second driver. I mean, really honestly, uh, that, made, uh, that made really good cool sense, sense, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. How often, so, how often are you hitting your three wood in the fairway? Not off the tee, in the fairway. Um, Less than he does a lot round. more once we got him in the right shaft. How many times you hitting like your wedges in the fairway or whatnot? I mean, a it's, lot. Give yeah. yourself more space there. Like, add the add the length up front. Utilize me, you, you guys. Hmm. I'm not in the same category. I need more. I need more head coverage in my bag, Billy. Yes, you do. Yes, we we, we all Two, know this. to be exact. <laughs> First off, we need to talk about this. Kansas State. Back-to-back -back wins versus Dude, top nine and eight. You're teams. not making the tourney. You're not making the tourney. The head it doesn't matter. Reward. We're in the best conference in the freaking NCAA. The, this is going to vouch very well for us. You are not changing the parameters of this bet. The bet <laughs> I'm, not, was I'm not changing the parameters. I'm they saying either make we're it we're in the best conference. Or they don't. Well, I know. And but when the they don't conference. make it, I bequeath the head covers to you. It's a big word for a Yep. waiting to use that <laughs> yeah. for what like a yeah. guy that just you know uh, just yeah. this guy yeah exactly fair enough fair enough they're gonna make the tournament reason the number NIT? five, <laughs> reason <laughs> number five. <laughs> yeah. TJ might be a regular host on the show yeah uh, right. And that would uh, that's actually something that uh, I was actually doing some borderline trigonometry uh, in preparation for this. Um, but it's lie angle check. Uh, you hear a lot of people talk about lies and, uh, you know, we've so far we've mentioned it a little bit here and there, but, you know, just to go through a, an actual lie angle check, mm. uh, I will advise anyone who has ever used face tape on their the face of their iron uh doing lie angle checks um don't believe that uh i would say anyone who uses a lie board uh they should probably stop doing that because that also lies uh a lot, a lot lie, of lie. Lie, board lies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. lie board lies um 
for a various number of reasons, um, mostly because on a center strike at the time you're hitting the live board, it's already after you hit the golf ball. So it really doesn't have any impact on it. Uh, hopefully, Good point. Uh, unless if you chunk fat it, <laughs> Billy. Um, and, uh, hey, but I would say the, like, just to be able to check. Uh, so the best way to check it is, I wish I had a golf ball here probably do somewhere let's pretend this thing is a golf ball um best way to check it is to just draw a line on the golf ball put it straight up and down uh with maybe a dry erase marker and then have the club come in and through and hit it and then you'd see on the club not only where you hit the golf ball whether it was toe heel but you'd also see uh the angle of where that um that line that was straight up and down and in all honesty if it's fairly close the the lie is pretty good uh if it's really off then you might need to bend it or you know send it back into the manufacturer to have them bend it or replace the heads wow or or build a whole new set um now the reason why trigonometry comes into play is because the lie angle will affect higher lofted clubs more than lower lofted clubs um, and to be honest, I don't know the exact number, uh, the, the coaching case that I have for that is that the technique and how you square the club face and swing direction, low point control, all that stuff probably has a greater influence on it, but assuming that you're hitting ball first and you have decent face control, uh, the lie angle could have an impact and definitely a higher impact on your, uh, higher lofted clubs. Mm -hmm. So just get it checked out, find out. What does it do specifically just for somebody that doesn't know if, if your clubs are too yeah. upright, what's your miss going to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll, it'll tend to be a little bit left. Um, just because as the club is, uh, you're kind of sitting side straddle, uh, next to the golf ball. Uh, so you're anchoring it from like one side, uh, and the club has loft on it. So then as that the leading edge is pointing straight the face actually points a little left and as you increase more like that toe up idea um then the club face will actually point more left hang on a second i'll be right back talk amongst yourselves yeah this no, is still here, guys. Sorry. this oh yeah darn it <laughs> still there. I he walked away <laughs> yeah but you can't yeah. speak to us because your microphone isn't on your airpods I can you don't want to hear us the opening behind him every time i like i look away and i look back and i think he's got like this big king motherfucking oh, chair chair-er. yeah he's i'm like oh man he's wrong oh. this mother oh no it's just yes. this is an hello <laughs> tj yeah. sullivan here no when you rough up I'll you bow before. before me and kiss this ring but so this is an example of a club that i would probably want to recommend someone gets fit for That's uh, like He's rocking that bad boy right now. <laughs> no, this was actually, this was a gift from one of my students. It's, uh, it was her grandfather's or her dad's two iron. Uh, oh. Sweet. Are you putting it in the yeah. bag? Oh, no, not at all. Hickory shaft? It, yeah. It's, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I have not taken a full swing with it. <clears throat> I would need a balata ball just in case. Um, yeah. But so let's say, for example, this is pointing, the leading edge is pointing directly at the camera mm -hmm. and there is loft on this, but let's just pretend that there was more loft on it. Mm -hmm. So the, where you hit the ball, because hopefully we're not hitting the ball here, Billy. Uh, and if we're hitting it here, yeah. <clears throat> then that, that face is actually pointing a little bit to the left. Now, if it was a whole bunch up like this, the, that face would be pointing a lot to the right. And then if it was pointing a whole bunch like this, it would be pointing to the left. And as I go even farther, so as I do this, and as I go more this way, it just points more and more and more and more to the left. Yeah. Again, um, and then the same thing is true if it's too flat, if it's going this way, um, <clears throat> going off to the right. So the challenge for you to figure out is I don't think you necessarily need to hit every single club in your bag. You can probably hit maybe two with that little dry erase marker on the golf ball, hit a few shots, find out, okay, yeah, these are way off or they're pretty close. So you, do you put that, sorry, I just want to clarify. Do you put the line just horizontally on the ball? Is that <laughs> vertical. Oh, vertical. Oh, vertical. Okay. I was, I was, yeah. I don't know why that was a yeah. struggle. Like, for that, like where this little shiny part is right here. So if this oh. is a golf ball, I'm just going to put the line right here. I see what you're saying. Okay. I wasn't. I now I see why you fired Billy as a client because well, he doesn't listen to you. What was what? that? I'm sorry. I said, I said, now I see why you fired Billy as a client because he doesn't listen to you. Huh? <laughs> what was that again? Come again? <laughs> I don't listen to anybody. Do what I want. That. 
Oh, it's yeah. true. You don't. I do what I want. EJ's gone. You blaze, oh, your, back. You blaze your own path. I do. So yeah, you would just can. you would just draw the line right here, let the ball sit like this, and then have the club come in and hit it like that. That makes so okay. it. Show, yeah. Then it shows up. And then if the ball actually makes a mark this way, then you know it's either upright yep. or flat and vice versa. Depending on for, the those, side of the for those just listening, he held the ball up to the camera with a vertical line on it and was saying yeah. if it's one way or the other, your lie is too flat or upright. But you gotta go find the ball. You go find go to ball. YouTube, subscribe, yeah. and like <laughs> the video. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, subscribe to the channel, like the video, make sure you hit that notification button too, because then you'll be and leave a comment because that matters. One hundred percent. Yes. I mean, Absolutely. come on. Now. So, let let me ask you about putter fittings. Uh, we've talked a lot about drivers and irons and wedges. What about putters? Uh, that's a, a great question um, because the first man, iteration you're elevating list... your questions, Dave. You went from good to great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the first iteration of my list as to why someone should get fit, uh, it, should, it was originally uh, driver, irons, wedges, putter, and uh, fairy woods. <laughs> uh, so that was the original answer. Uh, I'm glad we went this route, though. Yeah. <laughs> so um, putter fitting is is just as valuable. Um, in the grand scheme of things, um, and actually I had this prepared, so for for someone who is um in the like 100 to 90 range they're probably losing like 1.4 based on our study 1.4 strokes on putting but they're losing 2.6 strokes on driving um so i don't want to say putting doesn't matter uh because it does it's mm. you know a stroke and a half per round um so i think the the most important thing with getting fit for a putter is probably the lot, the length of the club matters the most so that way you can get your eyes appropriately in position. Uh, and I won't say over the ball or inside the ball, there, there's too many different dynamics there. Um, but just to be able to bet, best see the line. <clears throat> and then what's incredible is that the style of the putter head and where the lines are on the putter head can influence where you tend to aim the putter. <clears throat> So Billy, I'm going to pick on you, um, but, You're not but there is, there is a chance that because of the putter head that you so chose, it could be influencing the putter head to actually be aiming left without you knowing it, mm -hmm. uh, which then causes you to leave the face open and then push your putts. I'm not saying that that's the case. I'm just saying it could, right. Um, right. generally as your eyes are attracted kind of towards the back of the putter, uh, you'll tend to aim a little bit more right. And as your eyes are attracted more towards the front of the putter, more like a uh, standard, like a, a ping answer uh, with like a, uh, or even like the Scotty Cameron, I think it's the Newport <clears throat> with like the one line right on the top. Mm -hmm. uh, that would actually uh, ha help someone aim more left. Um, so as you're maybe switching putters, there could be an influence on that as, as far as like where you actually, where your eyes attract. Uh, and again, it could affect. So again, mostly length and head design, and then followed closely by the lie angle, just based on uh, where the hands are uh, in the putting stroke. Interesting. That would be an interesting video for us to do. Is maybe take that laser. What the heck was that thing called, Dave? That the laser pointer putting laser. Was that the PGA show? No, no. The, the thing we did in my basement. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't remember what it was called, but it was basically a device TJ that you put on your putter and it would give you an understanding of where your face was pointed. It would, it would basically shoot a laser out for you. And so, you yeah. See. And I mean, no free ads, but, uh, blast blast putting is yeah. basically that, uh, and it's, it's fantastic. So are they, so now that you've mentioned them, are they sending the check to us? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Mm -hmm. because it's not free as you clearly yeah. indicated since you said that i guess you'll be contacting them for the endorsement check thank you yeah, uh, i'll have my people contact you <laughs> exactly <laughs> your people you your people i've heard i've heard this story before the people the so people oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so right that's I, brad I, oh sorry go ahead i was gonna say like i never even thought <laughs> that a, the head of a putter would where your eyes sat would biased would it would influence your your stroke like it never even crossed my mind that that is a possibility that's i 
that that's a really good insight. Yeah, um, and and let me be very clear. Um, when generally what I see, um, it's it's kind of like two dimensional. Um, at where your eyes sit relative to the golf ball. Uh, so let's just say you know I'm here putting this way. And if my eyes are too far on the inside, in order for me to actually see the line of the ball, mm-hmm. uh, I would actually be tending to look more to the right. <clears throat> and if I get too far out in front of the ball or my eyes are beyond where the golf ball is, um, you know, just, just using like a mirror or you can literally like do the old fashioned, like have one ball right on top of your eyes and just drop it uh, just to kind of see where your eyes are. And if it's significantly one way or the other, it could influence the direction of what you think straight is. The other dynamic to that is, or the other aspect of that is just like the design of the head. So if you have something that's very rounded in the back or something that's very flat right next to the ball, it can influence where that putter aligns. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I just never thought of it. I mean, mostly because I'm not an intelligent person, but. You're very intelligent. Well, hold on a second, because you're talking about the Kansas State Wildcats not making it into the national championship, but now you're saying you're not an intelligent person. Common sense, Billy. Common sense. I don't believe you. There's intelligence (laughs) and common sense. (laughs) Let me ask you another. Hi, here. (laughs) Let me me ask you another question on putter fitting. Like the latest rage, and it kind of really gained steam when uh, Ricky showed up to a tournament with his graphite putter shaft. How much do you think, based on all of this, all the work you've done, how much do you think those putter shafts influence somebody's putting? Um, when you're talking about some of the guys at the highest, highest level, like Ricky um, or any of those guys out there, they're going to do everything they possibly can to gain some sort of competitive advantage. Of course. Um, I honestly, I don't know and or have enough information to really make a good comment on that. Um, I would say that the vast majority of people and the vast majority of putter staffs that are available to the common golfer uh, probably don't include that type of stuff. Yeah, because I mean, most putters just come with the typical true temper putter shaft that everybody's been using since the dawn of steel shafts and a putter, right? And sometimes they're black. Right. And, and for me, kind of so the, the worst thing that can happen uh, to a person like me is the winter time because you can't play golf. So you get bored and you do stupid things like buy a bunch of $30 putter shafts and reshaft all your putters just because you're bored. Um, I can't say I've noticed a measurable difference, but at the same time, a $30 investment is a lot different than a $250 investment for some of the really top of line putter shafts that are out there these days. What was the yeah, I, I think $50. What was that? There are putter shafts that are $250 and more. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you get one, Pete? Might make your game better. <laughs> so, you couldn't even, you can I, even I have finish that shaft <laughs> no. that I bought. In so, so here's the thing. Let, let's, let's go back to the numbers then. Let's go back to the numbers. TJ said that. Uh, he, he said that the putting for a, a golfer that's shooting between 90 and 100 accounts for one and a half strokes. So if Pete is stuck on 90 and he can't yeah. break 90, which was one of his goals yep. to get rid of the, the head covers, maybe he needs to, to redo the putter fitting and gain that stroke and a half. And no, no, no. I heard, let's go get fitted for a driver, is what TJ said. Uh, here's what I'll say. Um, because luckily golf tech gathers all this information. This isn't just me. Uh, I have all this info um, from them. But so from, for someone who is shooting between 90 and hundred uh, driving is about 2.6 strokes lost. Approach game is four strokes. Short game is two and putting is 1.4. So putting is the least important. That's, that is fascinating to me. It really is. You go, you go back to everyone is saying practice your short game to improve yep. your game. So, yep. but I do, I so do believe, the, but, but that might be for somebody that's that. at a, a lower handicap. They, not even then. No. So even for, 
So you take take the best players in the world, right? And you'd look mm-hmm. at the highest strokes gain, short game or putting, uh, and you know they're making you know a couple million dollars a year. And you take a look at the top drivers of the golf ball, and they're usually in the top ten of uh, the money list. Generally. It probably has everything to do with where the area of improvement can truly happen. Like, yeah, it's a lot easier to make it from closer, uh, and not everyone is going to make their like twenty footers, right? Know, the, the the odds of you making a the, the PGA Tour average from eight feet is fifty percent. So, I mean that's and it's really hard to hit it inside eight feet, uh, regardless of what the highlight reel show on Sunday. So that goes I mean, back the, to I mean, make everything. Yeah, yeah. So on our last episode that hasn't been released yet, but will be by the time we listen to this one, Pete was saying one of his goals was to become a better chipper and have fewer putts. And I countered with hit more greens and, and you're yes. saying the numbers from golf tech back that up. Uh, yes. I'm not saying that you shouldn't work on that, but if I were to prioritize, I would probably start with um, hitting the ball uh, farther, uh, maybe with a draw, if you're not drawing it, because uh, it's easier to hit it higher and land it softer if you draw it. Uh, and then I'd say, you know, then maybe take a look at the short game aspect after a uh, playing lesson and club fitting. I mean, I can hit the ball left. It's just low and left. Right. It's not high. It's low. Greening duck hook. Yeah. You know, like four left. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to anyone. You got that, that shot. Right. Never yeah. shows. It's true. Like, I'm not speaking anything we don't know. Huh. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. So there's still just Pete's bad at golf. That's what I heard. And we are going to go ahead and end the episode right there. This is such a great episode. TJ is always someone that we love to hang out with and talk about golf. But as always, I want to say thanks for listening or watching the Gripping Golf podcast. It's hosted by myself, Billy Daniels, Dave Miller, Pete Hansen, and John Johnson. Uh, Today's episode was written and researched by TJ Sullivan, Billy Daniels, Dave Miller, uh, John Johnson, Pete Hansen, uh, with technical production by myself, Billy Daniels, and we look forward to having you on future episodes or listening to future episodes. So, as always, thank you for the support. We appreciate it.